Now, again, as a reminder, today we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit and salvation. Next week, we'll be talking about the baptism of the Spirit, which is included in salvation, but I think you'll see why I decided to include it with uh, next week, because we're doing the baptism of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, specifically the sign gifts and whether or not they are relevant for today uh, or if they have ceased. So baptism of the Spirit will be next week along with the sign gifts. And then we will conclude very practically talking about how do we walk in the Spirit. Paul says that in Galatians chapter 5, walk in the Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And there's a lot of debate on how you can do that, how practically you Uh, can walk in the Spirit so that you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. So today we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit and salvation. But before that, I wanted to just quickly do a review of all that we've talked about up until this point. So we'll start with what we did week one. We we talked about the Holy Spirit, the deity and persony of uh, the deity and personhood rather of the Holy Spirit. And there's three main big buckets, as you'll see here. The Holy Spirit is God as demonstrated through his divine attributes, his divine works, his divine titles. The Holy Spirit is a person. Remember that quote, a person at its most basic level, not exhaustively or exclusively, but a person is someone who can say I with some level of self-reflexivity or self-awareness. Uh, the Holy Spirit says that. Set aside people, Paul and Barnabas, for me, the Spirit says, for a specific task that he has for them. Uh, also in his intellect, his emotion, his will, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit can be angered, things like that. The Holy Spirit is a person. And then third and finally for week one, we talked about the Holy Spirit in relation to the Trinity. So I'll draw the triangle once more. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there was two processions. The first one was the Father to the Son. Anybody remember what that's called? Eternal generation. Nice. And then we have the Son and the Spirit. Uh, What is this called? The Holy Spirit's relation to them? Eternal procession. Nice. You guys are ready for the exam. Eternal generation, the Father eternally generates the Son. The Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. We saw that in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, when I leave, I will send you the Spirit. But he also says, when I leave, the Father will send the Spirit. So together, the Father and the Son, the Spirit eternally proceeds from them. So that was week one. Uh, Review of week two, we really talked about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Remember that Hebrew word uh, for spirit, ruach, means spirit, breath, or wind, used roughly 400 times in the Old Testament, and out of those, 100 of them are references specifically to the Spirit of God or God's Spirit working in uh, the Old Testament. Testament. So a summary of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, obviously beginning in creation, the Holy Spirit hovering like a bird over the waters, animating creation at the command of the Father through the Son. Uh, the, the Spirit is at work in creation. He is at work in endowment for office. Uh, so we have the judges, we've got the kings, we've got the prophets in the Old Testament that the Spirit comes upon, fills, uh, falls on, and enables them for specific offices. Then we've got knowledge and insight, both in wisdom and in uh, just knowledge in general. And then finally, the source of prophecy was the Holy Spirit. So anytime a prophet would come to the nation of Israel and give them a prophecy, a word from the Lord, thus says the Lord, it would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. He is the source of prophecy. So that was really the summary of week two. And then the last time that we were together, we really talked about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And there are just countless passages that reference the Holy Spirit, as we talked about briefly last time. I said uh, the Spirit kind of drips from every page of the New Testament, so it was impossible for us to go through every single instance of that, but two main categories that we considered were the Holy Spirit and the life and ministry of Jesus, and that'll become increasingly important even today as we think about the the Holy Spirit and salvation, Uh, but we had the Holy Spirit involved in the birth of John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Christ preparing the way for Christ. And the Holy Spirit was involved involved in the birth of Christ, the virgin birth, the incarnation of the eternal Son of God taking on flesh. The Spirit was involved in that. And then the baptism of Christ or the commissioning of Christ, the Spirit 
descends from above like a dove and falls on and rests on Jesus. Then Jesus' temptation where the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Uh, Jesus' ministry, his message, his miracles. We looked at the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and how they were assigning the things that Jesus was doing in Mark chapter 3 uh, to Satan and Beelzebul. But ultimately, Jesus says, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus to do his miracles, to proclaim his message. And then we had the Holy Spirit being involved in the resurrection, the completion of uh, victory over sin and death. So a biblical theological summary of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, both the Old and New Testament. We talked about last time, it mediates God's presence. He mediates God's presence. Uh, he imparts life, both in the, uh, the original sense where we breathe uh, the breath in our lungs, which is given to us by the Spirit, but also new life through our new birth. Uh, he reveals truth through the doctrine of elimination. He fosters holiness, that's specifically in Galatians. He supplies power to accomplish ministry tasks, and he affects unity specifically between the Jews and the Gentiles and ultimately within the church. So there's, there's no mo- no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Christ is all and in all. And the Holy Spirit affects unity amongst all of the people that make up the body of Christ. So in a nutshell, that's all that we've talked about so far. And this week we're talking about the Holy Spirit at the beginning of salvation. Now, before we get to that, I want you to know that in some sense, we're specifically talking about the Holy Spirit today, but we're also specifically not. And this is where the doctrine of inseparable operations comes in, because oftentimes in the New Testament, salvation and the things that were intended to accomplish salvation, in a sense, are attributed to the Son. He's the one that lived. He's the one that died. He's the one that resurrected. He's the one that ascended to the Father. All of those different things. But what we can see is, if I could draw sort of a crass illustration, is what we even talked about last time is that the Spirit is involved pre-salvation in the life and ministry of Jesus, right? Enabling him, giving him uh, the things that he need, leading him uh, to the cross, so to speak. So even before salvation is accomplished in time, the Holy Spirit is at work in the person in, in and ministry of Jesus Christ. So in that sense, the Holy Spirit is before the cross, kind of looking forward to it. And now from our vantage point, the Holy Spirit kind of leads us back to the cross. So even in the the missions that we talked about where the Father sends the Son to accomplish salvation, obviously the Holy Spirit is actively involved in that as we talked at length last time. But now as the Holy Spirit applies salvation, he takes all of the things that Christ accomplished on the cross and applies them to us as we will see. So the Holy Spirit from beginning to end is involved in salvation, uh, but specifically today we're going to focus post-cross. So we're looking back to the cross and the Holy Spirit is applying the things that Christ accomplished for us on the cross. And so everything that we're going to talk about from regeneration to conversion to justification, all of those things, the Spirit is involved in each one of them. Just like in a sense, the Son is and the Father is because of inseparable operations. They don't do things apart from themselves. The Trinity, the Godhead always operates as one God. But so that you can kind of visualize that. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the cross. And now, in a sense, the Holy Spirit leads us to the cross where we meet Jesus. Does that make sense? Uh, So the Spirit is involved end to end in the process of salvation. So let's get specific as to what the Spirit is, is doing as he is leading us back to the cross. The first thing there on your note sheet is he convicts of sin. Now, in some sense, this may seem obvious, but this is something that is specifically attributed to the Spirit of God. He convicts people of their sin. Now, here's a question that I'd like some feedback on. Does the Holy Spirit only interact with people who are believers, or does he interact with people who are unbelievers as well? What do you guys think? Both. Both? In what ways? Okay, pre-Christian. What does that mean? In other words, not regenerate. Okay, not regenerate. Good. What, what is the Holy Spirit? How does he interact with people who are not followers of Christ? So, to apply it, he would um, draw us to Christ. I mean, we really cannot do this. Yeah. 
He quickens, okay, yeah, he draws us. There's a, an effectual calling there by the Spirit of God. I would also posit that conviction of sin, though in an ongoing way, obviously we're, we're still even as believers convicted of sin, but in the initial sense, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin before salvation. That's part of the drawing, right? That's part of the eyes being opened. Um, so the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and this is why I called it in the note sheet, um, the Holy Spirit's work in pre-salvation. The Holy Spirit's work pre-salvation uh, to begin drawing people uh, to salvation by convicting them of sin. And the Holy Spirit prompts, in a sense, an awareness of sin. So before we read John, uh, Romans chapter 3, Paul ta is talking about um, sin, and he says, no one does good, no one seeks after God. Right? So there's this sense in which we are steeped in our sinfulness. Paul obviously says in Ephesians chapter 2, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, we are s enslaved to our sinfulness. So even for us to become aware that we are sinful, as the Bible describes it, the Spirit of God needs to open our eyes. So this is the Spirit of God kind of at work pre-salvation, drawing people uh, to himself, opening our eyes to an awareness of our sin in the face of a holy God. Now, John 16, verses 8 through 11 says, And when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. So that's where we can kind of get the, the idea of pre-salvation. The Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin, not their unbelief in Christ, so to speak. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and living a life of righteousness, which Christ uh, did for us and that now we continue to follow his example in that because I go to the father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged so the Holy Spirit the first thing his first action in salvation is conviction of sin so in that moment when you became aware of your sinfulness and there's often associated with that a sense of overwhelming uh, guilt perhaps or an overwhelming uh, just acknowledgement before the Lord of our sin in the face of a holy God. It is the Spirit of God that led you to that place. So as you even think about your, your testimony and how you got saved, uh, the way that you got saved is the Spirit of God convicted you of your sin. He prompted an awareness of sin. He prompted an awareness of your need for Christ, right? Concerning righteousness, I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. He, com he convicted you of your sin, opened your eyes to uh, the truth of your sin in the face of a holy God. Now, almost simultaneously, there's, there's a logical ordering of these things, uh, but they're not necessarily happening in time how we would think them. But simultaneously, as we are being convicted of our sin, the second thing that we see the Holy Spirit being involved in is what's referred to in Scripture as regeneration, right? Where the Spirit regenerates us to new life in Christ. Uh, so with each of these, I want to give a definition, again, from my professor, Greg Allison, in his uh, writings in the Baker Compact Dictionary of Theological Terms. Uh, but let's define uh, uh, regeneration, right? It says, the mighty work of God by which unbelievers are given a new nature, that's important, being born again. It is both the removal of one's old self and the imparting of a new self that is responsive to God. Unlike conversion, which is the human response to the gospel, regeneration is completely a divine work to which human beings contribute nothing. So regeneration, it's basically when your old nature, your sin nature is being stripped away, and in its place you're being given a new nature, as Jesus even talks about in John chapter 3, that where you are born again. Now, the way that the Bible <coughs> describes uh, regeneration, uh, describes the Holy Spirit being the efficient cause of regeneration. Now, this is interesting because if we could think about the Trinitarian sort of ordering that we often talk about. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We always say it in that sort of ordering. So not an order of importance, um, but there seems to be sort of a logical, the Father generates the Son, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So we say it that way. Salvation, regeneration, 
is the Trinitarian processions reversed. So we could have the same sort of ordering. Holy Spirit, Son, Father. But now let's just say you and me are down here, and this is the order that it goes. So the, we are being drawn, convicted by the Holy Spirit. As we are regenerated, we'll get more into this, we are united to Christ. We are given to the Father. That's why John says in John chapter 1, those who believe in the Son have been given the right to be called children of God. And usually when the word God, the name God, is used in the, in the New Testament, it's most often referring to the Father. So in terms of the Trinitarian relations, they happen in salvation in reverse. And that makes sense because we have talked about the, the temporal missions of the Father and the Son. So the Father sends the Son to accomplish salvation. Uh, the Father and the Son together send the Spirit to apply salvation. So in applying salvation, it's almost like the, the, the missions are happening in reverse, in time. Yeah. So that would be regenerate you and me. Yes. Not unregenerate Correct. You and me. Yes. So this is when the Holy Spirit draws us, opens our eyes, convicts us, regenerates us. He pulls us into our union with Christ. We're given to the Father as uh, children of God. Uh, so in that sense, we interact with each member of the Trinity, uh, both in time, in our salvation, and in an ongoing way through our sanctification. Uh, but yes, this happens at regeneration, where the Holy Spirit sort of uh, makes us a new person, gives us, uh, takes away our old sin nature, and um, gives us uh, the new nature in Christ. So regeneration, right? The Holy Spirit is the efficient cause, meaning he's the reason why it happens. It's Trinitarian processions in reverse. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7 kind of talk about this. It says, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yes. Right. Christ. Does the Holy Spirit ever make that offer to someone who will not come to Christ? Is it only, only to people who he knows will receive? Or is it possible that someone could have that offer and not respond? That is a great question. <laughs> Essentially, what you're asking is, does the Holy Spirit only convict the elect, right? Uh, those who Paul would talk about in Ephesians chapter 1 were predestined for adoption as sons before the foundation of the world. Uh, my concession would be that, yes, the Holy Spirit would not convict someone, um, at least in the same way that we're talking about, in this pre-salvific sense. Um, it would be a different role where it would be judgment. So the, the, the threefold office there in John that we just read, sin, righteousness, judgment, the Holy Spirit, in a sense, um, what even Jesus talks about in Matthew or in Mark chapter 6 when he sends out the apostles, and says, if they don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet. That was a pronouncement of judgment on the people that rejected the gospel. Uh, in the same sense, the, uh, the Spirit does that. Judgment of the world is pronounced, but it is different. It's a different drawing. Uh, there is no drawing of the Spirit for people who are not elect. Uh, so we'll get to some of that. Yeah. I love the fact that you use the word efficient. Yeah. Yeah. They would choose to because you changed their heart. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is at work in regeneration. He's the cause of generation. The Holy Spirit is the efficient cause. Now, what's interesting is the instrumental cause is the word, prayer, and gospel. So we kind of talked about this before, uh, but what tools does the Spirit use? The Spirit uses the word, the prayer, and uh, wor the word, prayer, and the gospel in the drawing of sinners to salvation. So it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It's not, you know, spontaneous salvation. There are tools being utilized by the Spirit, and those tools are the Word of God, uh, prayer, and the gospel. We'll see that in, for example, Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing, 
and hearing through the word of Christ. Uh, or another phrase would be, you know, the word of God, that the scriptures, the, those things that are breathed out by God that testify to Christ as the Holy Spirit testifies to Christ through the scriptures. So the Holy Spirit uses these tools, these instruments uh, as the efficient cause, right? The Holy Spirit being the one doing the work, but using the tools of the word, uh, prayer, and the gospel. So basically, the gospel goes out, the word is taught, preached, proclaimed, whatever, and the Holy Spirit uses it to convict them of their sin, to draw them into um, salvation. Now this gets to what Lynn was just asking about, whether or not the Holy Spirit would draw someone to uh, conviction of sin, let's say, uh, if they were not elect. Um, again, it is my concession that regeneration, if we were going to ask, when does this happen? So I guess the question is, do we have faith, therefore we're regenerated, or are we have faith because we are regenerated? Which one comes first? Uh, my uh, concession would be uh, regeneration precedes faith, meaning that you are regenerated, and as part of that, and we'll get into this, uh, faith is given to you almost as this as this gift, uh, as you're drawn by the Holy Spirit into uh, salvation. So here's a quote that I read this week about this. It says, regeneration precedes faith. It comes before faith. When regeneration occurs, a person willingly believes, and that's the, the key, willingly believes, because Romans 3, no one does good, no one seeks after God. So it says regeneration occurs in a person because they're regenerate, regenerated, willingly believes and repents and follows Jesus. This is because the orientation of the person's will has been decisively changed. The crux is the relationship between regeneration and saving faith. Regeneration comes first, faith follows. And this is important uh, because oftentimes we will say, well, you need to have faith, and we do need to have faith. That's what Jesus himself says in Mark 1, 14 and 15, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and believe, have faith, trust in uh, the gospel. But as we'll see in a second, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, uh, those whose wills are bound to their sinfulness and they're enslaved to their sinfulness, that's the way that scripture talks about it, it would be impossible to willingly choose to repent and believe when your will is bound and in slavery to uh, sin. So regeneration precedes faith. Now, obviously we see this because we are dead, right? We are dead people, spiritually speaking. Paul says that in Ephesians 1, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you, were, uh, in which you once walked. Uh, we are unable to believe. We are unable to uh, even come to this place of confessing Christ in and of ourselves apart from the Spirit of God uh, transform, transforming us. Uh, that's what is said in John 6, 64 and 65, that there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So it says we are unable to believe. It's not just something that we just sort of in our, uh, you know, we clench our fist and we say, I'm going to believe in Jesus today. There has to be an act of God through the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin, uh, to regenerate you. And again, this is, there's a logical ordering of these things, but as you're being regenerated, you're having faith, right? It's not like one than the other in, in, in the sense of like 30 seconds passes. It's all kind of happening at the same time, but there's a logical sequence within those things. Similar to the Trinity, right? They all exist. They've all eternally existed, but there's a logical ordering within them, the same of salvation. So regeneration precedes faith. They're kind of happening simultaneously, but in a, in a logical ordering, regeneration comes first. And then because you are regenerated, you cry out to the Lord in faith. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, even what Paul talks about to the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? He says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this says, this is what I told you, that no one can come to me, no one can believe unless it is granted him by the Father. So we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are unable to believe and we must be born again. That's what Jesus talks to uh, Nicodemus about in John 3, verses 1 through 8. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, 
for no one can do these, th- these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not, marvel that, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So we must be born again. We have to be regenerated. We have to be given a new nature. That's what happens in the process of regeneration. And this happens again uh, as we are prompted by the Spirit and called by the Spirit to salvation. We also, in this whole process, must be given a new heart slash made into a new creation. Romans 6, 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him, with Jesus, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Kind of what Martin Luther calls the bondage of the will because we are enslaved to our sin. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Ezekiel 36, another one, uh, I don't think it's listed there for you, where it talks about, I will remove their heart of stone, I will replace it with a heart of flesh. So regeneration precedes faith. It's not that we have faith, therefore we are regenerated. We are regenerated, therefore we have faith. And we say that, again, because we are dead, we are enslaved to our sins, we are unable to believe, we must be born again, we must have a new heart, and we simply don't have the things that it takes or requires uh, to do those things on our own. We need the Spirit of God uh, to do that work uh, in and through um, the gospel being proclaimed. So, conviction of sin, regeneration. The third thing, which again in its logical ordering, is union with Christ. We are uh, placed in Christ, so to speak, by the Spirit and sealed, and we have this union with Christ. Now, here's the definition. It says, the mighty work of God to join his people, this is what union with Christ means, the mighty work of God to join his people in the eternal covenant with the Son who accomplished their salvation. Through union, believers are identified with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, And God communicates all his blessing of salvation, grace, regeneration, redemption, eternal life, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Christ dwells in those with whom he is united, and they in turn dwell in him. So we see the Holy Spirit unites believers to Christ. We are united to Christ, and through that we are uh, sharing in these specific things that are mentioned there, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. But here's what Paul says in Romans 8. Verses 9 and 10. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So this Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, that seals us in this holy union with Christ, that gives us access to the benefits of salvation that are offered to us in Christ. So believers identify with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, which is why, by the way, when we do baptisms, have you ever wondered why we say, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? They used to say growing up, my, dad, my dad's a pastor, he would always say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. That's the idea. We are identifying with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension through Um, our baptism through our union with Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 11 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin, like Christ, still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him 
in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit unites believers to Christ. In that, we identify with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, and ascension. Meaning all the things that Christ accomplished in salvation now uh, become true of us. Yeah, Mark. Correct. Yeah. So for the, for the camera, I got chided in a, in a loving way to say the questions for the camera. Thank you, Gary. Um, so the question was basically, if we are dead to sin and alive in Christ, why do we still sin? Is that a fair summary of the question? Um, we still sin because we live in a fallen world with fallen bodies. So this is part of the, the hope of the future resurrection of a glorified body um, is that we no longer will struggle with sin. It will no longer be a part of what we do. So we're still surrounded by sin. Uh, we live in a sinful world where uh, people's sin that perhaps is not our own still affects us, right, in perhaps sinful ways. Uh, we still battle and resist the flesh. There's a big debate in Romans 7, by the way, of whether or not, you know, that's Paul pre-conversion, post-conversion, all that kinds of stuff. Um, I do think, in general, the language of um, I do what I want to do, or do what I don't want to do, and I do what I you know, all that stuff, right? That whole idea, <laughs> whatever it says, uh, my mind's not working too well. But that, I think I, I sympathize and I empathize with that because that's, that's how I feel sometimes in my Christian life of like, I desire to do the things of Christ and yet my flesh still craves the things of this world. And so, you know, even in Galatians chapter five, for instance, there's another passage where Paul talks about, hey, don't gratify the desires of the flesh because it's still a possibility. Rather, walk in the Spirit. So we're also talking about nature, like our sin nature um, has been transformed, right? Where we no longer have a sin nature in the same way that we did from Adam. We inherited our sin nature from Adam. In Christ, we inherit a righteous nature, but we still live in a fallen world in a fallen body, and we still uh, engage in sinful acts, right? In, In Hebrews, it talks about sin is crouching at the door, uh, it so easily entangles us, or rather Genesis 4 says that, and then Hebrews talks about it so easily entangles us. Uh, so we live in a fallen world with fallen bodies uh, that still lead us to sin, but now we have the Holy Spirit of God where we're not enslaved to sin any longer. We have the power and the option and the ability to say no to sin, whereas before we were enslaved and in bondage to it. Uh, now we have the power offered to us in the Spirit to uh, have victory over it. Uh, so there is that sort of duality and dichotomy there. Um, But yes, we're given a new nature in and through regeneration. Okay, union with Christ. Uh, Believers identify with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and and ascension. Uh, Believers also receive all of the benefits of salvation. These are listed in Ephesians chapter 1, and we won't read all those verses for sake of time. Um, but I'll just read them there. They're on your your note sheet. Election, we are elected to salvation. That's Ephesians 1.4. Predestination for adoption as sons or daughters of God, Ephesians 1.5. We are given the grace of God, Ephesians 1.6. We are offered redemption through the shedding of his blood and forgiveness, Ephesians 1.7. The knowledge of God's will, we are offered an inheritance. We are offered the Spirit himself, uh, to seal us in those things at the end there, Ephesians 1, 14. Uh, so in our union with Christ, we identify with Christ. All the things that were true of Christ in terms of the victory of Christ now belongs to us. Uh, the sinlessness of Christ from a justification standpoint, which we're about to get to, uh, now belongs to us as well. The future ascension uh, or, or the ascension of Christ and our future glorification with Christ belongs to us. Uh, all of those things in our union with Christ. Yeah. 
Um, election versus predestination. So predestination is, the way that I've heard it described before, is basically elect is the action, predestination is the plan, if that makes sense. So like elect is the, you, uh, like being placed into that position before the foundation of the world, predestination, you were predestined to be elected in that sense, to be chosen. Um, so it's God's uh, divine decree uh, before the foundation of the world and through election, he fulfills that decree. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Right. Yes, there's different perspectives on that. Uh, on that predestination, um, it depends on because there's various perspectives on reprobation. Reprobation, if you didn't know, is kind of like the opposite of of election. Election is more of the positive sense of we are elected to be saved in Christ. Reprobation would be, um, in a sense, I don't like using this word, but for just clarity's sake, election to damnation. So that's what she's talking about. Reprobation, predestination. I would agree does include those two things, um, but it's sort of the, the plan and then election or the, f- the, the following it through uh, would kind of be the action of those things. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, okay, moving on, we're going to justification. So we have talked about conviction of sin by the Spirit, regeneration by the Spirit, union with Christ by the Spirit, and now we are talking about justification. And again, you can kind of see the logical ordering of this regeneration. We're given a new nature, and in and through that, the old nature is removed. The new nature is given. Uh, we're unified with Christ, and now we are justified with Christ. Here's the definition uh, for justification. The mighty act of God by which he declares sinful people not guilty, but righteous instead. He does so by imputing or crediting the perfect righteousness of Christ to them. Thus, while they are not actually righteous, God views them as being so because of Christ's righteousness. So justification is often referred to as the great exchange. On the cross, Jesus becomes a propitiation of our sin. He becomes sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, So on the cross, uh, God pours out his wrath on Christ, uh, the sinless one, and what we receive is the righteousness of Christ. Christ, the great exchange, right? Where his, his righteousness is imputed, is given to us, is credited to us uh, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. That happens because of our uh, regeneration. So there are two parts of justification that we just talked about, forgiveness of sins. Um, Romans talks about, you know, Romans 3.23, all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. We need forgiveness of sin. So in justification, our sins are forgiven and imputation of righteousness, where we receive uh, the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness, by the way, the, the simplest way that I like to define that is basically living rightly before God. So and you're not supposed to use the word in the definition, but uh, righteousness, living rightly, right? Doing things rightly, uh, things that would honor the Lord rather than choosing our sin, rather than choosing rebellion. We live rightly. We live lives of righteousness before the Lord, which obviously we know that we can't do living in a fallen world with our fallen bodies. Yet Christ did it. So from a legal standpoint, we are declared righteous, through our justification. So we are forgiven of our sins. We're imputed our righteousness. We are declared, it's a declaration by God, that we are declared righteous. So the Holy Spirit and um, the Holy Spirit and justification, which is there in 1 Corinthians 6. I think I skipped that on the slides. Um, so we'll go down to uh, the next one, which is adoption. <clears throat> so Like I said, we talked about regeneration, we talked about union with Christ, justification. Uh, Next, we've got uh, adoption, which the definition here, the mighty work of God to take sinful people, enemies who are alienated, that's Romans 5, and separated from him, and embrace them as beloved children into his family forever. Redemption through the Son of God results in their adoption as sons and daughters together with the reception of the spirit of adoption by whom God is called Abba, Father. So the Holy Spirit and adoption. Uh, we have the spirit of adoption, which is talked about in Romans 8.15, Galatians 4, 4 through 6, uh, where we cry out, Abba, Father. In a sense, it is testifying in our, in our spirit that we truly are children of God. So it's an inner witness that we have truly been regenerated, we've been justified, we've been forgiven, uh, all of those things that have happened. And now because of that, John 1, we have been given the right to be called 
children of God. And the Spirit of God testifies in our hearts that we truly are children of God, where we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, along with that, there's the idea of sonship, uh, which implies inheritance, which is what Paul talks about in uh, Ephesians 1, for example, where we are sealed by the guarantee of the Spirit, where we're guaranteed our inheritance in Christ uh, forevermore. So the Holy Spirit, as we are adopted into the family through regeneration, justification, union with Christ, all of those things, uh, we are given all of the benefits of Christ. So in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is referred to as the firstborn of all creation. Now, we obviously know uh, that he's not created. He's not a firstborn, as you might think of your children. Firstborn in, term, in terms of inheritance ordin, or ordering, right? Where he is the one that receives the inheritance from the Father. Now, what Paul talks about in Ephesians 1 is that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It also goes on and talks about the inheritance that we will receive through Christ guaranteed to us by the Spirit of God. Uh, so this inheritance, which is given to Christ by the Father, the Father gives the Son his inheritance now, is offered to every single person that is in Christ, which is uh, different from what an inheritance would be like in the Bible, for example, where all of the inheritance would go to the firstborn, and that was it right? Too bad for the second, third, fourth, however many you had. It was the firstborn that would get all of the inheritance. In Christ, all of the inheritance that goes to Christ goes all to you as well and to me. We all share equally in the inheritance of Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because we are a child of God through our adoption into uh, the family of God, the mighty work of God to take, to take sinful people and embrace them as beloved children into his family forever. That's the idea of adoption. Next, we're going to talk about conversion. This is oftentimes what we think about in terms of calling someone to a response of the gospel. It's a response of repentance, faith, and confession of Christ, where we're saying you need to repent, you need to have faith, and we'll kind of define some of these things. But conversion is another aspect of salvation that the Spirit is involved with. So let's define this. It says here, the human response to the gospel um, is conversion. It consists of two aspects, repentance or sorrow for sin, which we know is prompted by the Spirit, hatred of it and resolve to turn from it, and faith or belief in God's provision of forgiveness and trust in Christ for salvation. Uh, so we talked about, again, regeneration comes before conversion in a logical ordering sense. Uh, we go from rejection of Christ to submission to Christ. We go from blindness to seeing, from death to life. All of those things happen because of our regeneration. As we are given the gift of faith, uh, we call out in this conversion moment of repenting of our sins and placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, so the Holy Spirit and his involvement in conversion. Uh, the Holy Spirit in ignites faith in conjunction with hearing uh, the gospel, uh, which we read in that verse in Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. Uh, the Spirit prompts repentance of sin and confession of Christ. So Jesus, again, when he starts his earthly ministry in Mark 1, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and believe in the gospel. So conversion is sort of the flip side of regeneration, in that regeneration is wholly an act of God. Conversion, then, because we've been transformed by God, is our response, where we respond with repentance, turning from our sin, placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Our will has been changed. Our nature has been changed. We've been legally justified. We've been adopted. We have been uh, united with Christ. All of these things happen. And because they've happened, because uh, we have been made a new creation, we've been born again, we respond with repentance and faith. Um, any questions on that? Yes. yes. So when we pray for somebody's salvation, we're really, if I understand this correctly, praying for their salvation. Yeah, so in a sense, so the question was, we're, when we pray for salvation, do we pray for their conversion? Um, it wouldn't be wrong to do that, but it's, it, we're taking all of the different aspects of salvation and sort of spreading them out so that we can you know, zoom in and think about them. They're, mostly, they're all happening sort of 
in a moment, right? So you, it's not like you're regenerated here and then, you know, a year later you're converted. So it all happens at the same time. So in a sense, you could pray for them to be converted. Um, that wouldn't be wrong. Uh, but you're praying for salvation in its totality. You're praying for them to have a new heart. You're praying for regeneration. You're praying for justification. You're praying for adoption. You're praying for an awareness of sin, conviction of sin. All of those things which are all sort of happening uh, as the Lord draws to salvation. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So, just, I mean, basically praying for salvation. Yeah. Is, yes. We don't have to break it down. Yeah. No, you don't have to break it down of like, okay, let's, let's pray the ordus salutis, which is the Latin phrase for the order of salvation, um, which, you know, predestination, election, all of those things, justification. Uh, you, know, you don't need to go that minute. Uh, I think it would just be in a, in a more common context, it would be uh, praying for salvation. Uh, and through that, they would be converted. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll start with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if that happens, this is going to happen. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so often, like, the path to salvation is a long one, right? Sure. There may be moments, years apart. Mm -hmm. Would you consider that the Holy Spirit regenerating, or is there something else you would call that? Regeneration happens in a moment in time. Um, I would call that more uh, drawing. Drawing can happen over a long period of time where it's a conversation that you had with someone when you were eight that was kind of weird and you didn't really understand it. But then when you're 10, you start thinking about it. It's a sermon that you heard uh, where the gospel was preached and you had a response, but you, you, know, you weren't quite sure of all the details. It was a conversation with your parents. Those, those things, the, the Lord uses all of that to draw, uh, to uh, you know, potentially get to that moment of regeneration, right? Which... Uh, all of these things happen in that moment. Justification, right? Um, adoption, conversion. So in regeneration, you are converted. So even when, in, when we talk about the gospel, I was going to say, what do you need to do? You need to repent. You know, I'm not going to say you need to be regenerated, though that's true, cause, but that's, the, that's an act of God, right? That's exclusively only God can regenerate. Um, so we focus on what even Jesus focuses on, which is repent and believe, and the Spirit of God does, does the rest. Um, and it all happens, like I said, sort of simultaneously. So that was the, the Holy Spirit um, and accomplishing salvation. Um, now we're going to move on to the Holy Spirit and the ongoing work of salvation. So there's two parts to salvation. Um, it's often referred to as the already, not yet. There's what's already been accomplished. We've been justified. We've been regenerated. We've been converted. We've been adopted. All of those things. We have our union with Christ. But there's the not yet aspect, which would be glorification, would be our resurrected bodies, um, our eternal blessed hope, being with Christ forever. So the Holy Spirit is involved in the ongoing work of salvation. The first aspect of that, you'll see in your notes, is sealing. The Holy Spirit seals us in our relationship with Christ. He serves as the down payment he serves as the guarantee or what's referred to as the first fruit. So a definition for this is that all those who embrace the gospel and confess, confess the lordship of Jesus Christ by means of the Holy Spirit are in turn marked by the Spirit. That's from Allison and Kostenberger in their book, The Holy uh, Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, again, serves as the guarantee of our salvation um, he, he serves as um, the guarantee of the things that are yet to come. So that's Ephesians 1, verses for this, yeah, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glorious uh, grace." Uh, so we are sealed in our relationship with Christ as a guarantee of our salvation. Because again, we've already been saved, but we've not yet been saved. Right? Already in the sense of if we die today, to be absent with bodies, to be present with the Lord, but we've not 
we've not yet been saved in the sense of there's not resurrected bodies, there's not the new heavens and the new earth. That is yet to come. So we say already, not yet. So we've already been saved. That's been done, secured. The Spirit, uh, He guarantees those things, uh, but we are not yet saved. Uh, so He serves as the down payment of our um, inheritance, was what Paul talks about in Ephesians 1. So we also have the Holy Spirit uh, working in assurance of our salvation uh, slash glorification. So I put assurance and glorification. Sometimes those are separated. I put them together because one leads to the other. Our assurance of our salvation leads us to our glorification in that sense. Uh, You might say preservation where the Spirit keeps us in our salvation in Christ. No one can snatch us from the Father's hand uh, because of the work of the Spirit. Here's the definition for that. The subjective confidence that is the privilege of all genuine believers that they will remain Christians throughout their life. This doctrine is dependent on the doctrine of a perseverance, a perseverance rather, which is God's mighty act to preserve true Christians by his power through their ongoing faith until their salvation is complete. Uh, so the Spirit assures us of our salvation, and he does that in a couple of ways um, through. Uh, our adoption there, which you'll see uh, in Romans 8, for example, and through our fruit. So if you ask someone, how can you be sure that you are saved? Uh, Letters like 1 John in the New Testament, for example, passages like Romans 8, which talk about our adoption in Christ, where our spirit cries out, Abba, Father, testifying to our spirits that we truly are children of God. Uh, Galatians 5, which talk about the fruit of the spirit. Uh, So the idea is uh, you can be sure of your salvation by examining your life and the fruit that you have or perhaps don't have and what Scripture says is true of a believer. And the Spirit is involved in that process of making us more like Christ, producing fruit in us, and therefore giving us assurance, uh, preserving us in our salvation, leading us ultimately to our glorification. And so the last thing there is the Holy Spirit's work in sanctification, which is an ongoing reality for those who have been saved. Uh, The definition there, very simply, is the process of pursuing holiness and conforming more into the image of Christ, putting off sin and putting on the things of Christ. Uh, So the Holy Spirit is involved in our sanctification, in our growth in Christ. 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So the Spirit is involved in our sanctification. If you look at those seven things, all of these different aspects, uh, sanctification is cooperative between the Spirit and the person. So there's sort of a mystery to this in the sense of we are told, it's uh, obviously like salvation is by faith and faith alone, uh, by grace through faith. It has nothing to do with our works. And yet once we're saved, we're said, uh, we are told by James, faith without works is dead. Uh, So there's this cooperative reality between the Spirit of God working in us and us as people to pursue sanctification. It's a both and. Uh, So what Paul talks about in Philippians, for example, of work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Um, The question is, who does that? Obviously, the Spirit of God working through you produces the fruit, but it's also there's a cooperation where we have to put in effort. There's discipline. Paul talks about that. Train yourself for godliness. He talks about that in Corinthians of athletes discipline themselves for a perishable wreath. We for an imperishable wreath. So it's cooperative between the Spirit and the person. It's not just sit on your hands and the Holy Spirit makes you more like Christ uh, somehow mysteriously without you having to do anything. There's this sort of you pursue in faith, right? It's not works-based, Uh, It's not we're trying to earn anything, but it's out of the abundance of our love for Christ and our pursuit of him, we cooperate with the Spirit. Uh, We don't grieve the Spirit. Uh, We cooperate by pursuing the Word, which is his instrument uh, of choice, right, for changing us, and we grow and are sanctified because of it. Uh, In that process, the Spirit obviously convicts us of sin in an ongoing way. Uh, He prompts faith in us. He comforts us. He rebukes us. Uh, He empowers us to overcome temptation. And then he develops a willingness and a desire to please uh, the Lord. So those are the ongoing things of salvation, right? So there's the sealing, the down payment, the work of 
uh, salvation, the first fruits, which is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have the assurance, glorification, uh, our future reality already not yet, which is guaranteed to us by the Spirit. And then we have sanctification, which is the ongoing work of growing us, which is uh, enabled and empowered by the Spirit of God. Uh, so that's the Holy Spirit and salvation in a nutshell. Um, questions? Yes. Okay. So in the context of the elect, so the rejection of the gospel is really a, only applied to the elect because the Holy Spirit is not inviting the, those who are not elected to be saved into salvation. So it... Then, oh, sorry. So can I... Repeat? Yeah, absolutely. So the second question is then what should be our attitude towards who are not, those who are not invited? We expect them to commit acts of atrocities. Do we condemn through our lenses or do we have some passion? Because they have no way sure. of becoming into the kingdom. So therefore they cannot walk righteously. Right. Those are good questions. So the questions are about the elect. How do we think about them? Um, can they be held, we'll say, responsible for uh, the rejection of the gospel? So John Piper once said, uh, I don't agree with all of John Piper's stuff, but I, I thought this was helpful. He, he talked about um, no one gets dragged into the darkness kicking and screaming, right? Everyone that's in the darkness, what even it says in the Gospel of John, uh, this is the, the verdict. The light came into the world and they preferred the darkness. So anyone that's dead in their trespasses and sins is held responsible for that. Um, just like you and I, we are even after salvation, we're still held responsible for our sin. So there's this sort of uh, mysterious union between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility where we often feel like one should negate the other, uh, where God's sovereignty is just, okay, well, done deal. I can do whatever I want because God's going to do whatever he wants. Um, that's not what Scripture says, right? Scripture talks about often that man is responsible for the rejection of Christ. And ultimately, uh, people who are in hell, they are there because of their rejection of Christ. So in that sense, um, everyone that, that rejects Christ is rejecting the gospel of their own volition, right, in union with God's uh, sovereign decree of that. So there's, um, so often we think one has to be true and not the other. Uh, J.I. Packer calls them antinomies, which they were both um, exclusively, when you separate them, they both reach equally logical conclusions, but when you put them together, they seem to contradict. Um, but scripture puts them together, right? Scripture puts the free will that we have as individuals, like I could throw this marker and hit you in the head, I don't want to do that, but I could uh, because of my free will. And yet God is still sovereign and, and in control of all things. So in that sense, um, they are still held responsible. So in terms of how we view the elect, we don't know. Obviously, I would, I would hope you guys are the elect, that you're saved. Uh, but you don't know who is the elect. There's just no way to know. Um, so our responsibility is just to go and to tell, uh, to proclaim, uh, to pray for salvation, to, to plead with the Lord to save and um, those whom have been elected will be saved uh, through the proclamation of the word. Because even that sort of tension of uh, God has chosen before the foundation of the world, but we are still to go and to proclaim the gospel. Uh, so we're kind of involved in the choosing, meaning uh, we're involved in proclaiming the gospel that God will then use by his spirit to uh, bring people to salvation. So there's a lot of uh, mystery in the sense of, in our minds, though, they don't always work together. Um, but our response is the same, right? Is to go proclaim the, uh, the message of the Christ. So it, it wouldn't be like if someone rejected the gospel once, I wouldn't be like, well, I guess you're not the elect, you know? You know I was going to invite you to lunch, but now never mind, forget it. Um, so we, I would treat them the same. I would continue to plead with them because some people hear the gospel for years, 30, 40, 50 years, and then they respond when they're you know, in their 50s. Uh, so we just never know what the Lord's going to do and our responsibility is just to be faithful in proclaiming um, the gospel. Well, we're out of time, so I wanna, I'll pray for us. I'll be around afterwards if we've got other questions. Um, we've got two more weeks, so let's, let's, uh, let's finish well, uh, but let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for uh, just this opportunity that we had to reflect on the gospel, to reflect on uh, our salvation, our great salvation that's been accomplished in and through Christ Jesus, uh, and then applied to us by the Spirit of God. Uh, so, Father, I pray that because of this, that we would 
uh, just continue to worship you uh, because of your uh, great love for us, because of your adoption of us into your family, giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Father, I pray that we would just worship you uh, today as we go into service and listen to your word preached, and uh, we would just grow more into the likeness of Christ uh, because of our salvation accomplished in and through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.